Hello and welcome to Witch Please, a fortnightly podcast about the Harry Potter world. I'm Hannah McGregor. And I'm Marcel Cosman. And today, in honor of our myth-dispelling guest, I want us to talk about some myths that we've dispelled in our own lives. Ooh, dispelled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> ooh, yeah ooh. get it? Hannah, you're so smart. I wrote that. So smart. And I want to do that myth-dispelling in the sorting chat. Oh, I can't wait. So, Marcel, I texted you and was like, yeah, you know, this is like we're talking to somebody who wrote a book about about widespread myths. So, like, <laughs> let, let's let talk about some of those things that we sort of grew up being taught and then came to understand as adults are not true. And the first one you sent me. <laughs> Tell the good people what your first myth was. So the, the first thing that came to mind is um, a widespread myth that was making the rounds in my residence when I was uh, in first year of university. And it is the myth that eating celery is like negative calories because apparently celery has less calories than you would expend to eat and digest it. And so <laughs> therefore eating celery is like negative calories. <laughs> <laughs> Which made, immediately made me think about my favorite, like, women's magazine hop weight loss tip, which was um, turn the temperature down, because if you're colder, your body will use more energy. <laughs> just, just shivering in your freezing cold home, eating celery, like... We went beyond the sort of celery, the celery limitations. And yeah. obviously, I, because <laughs> at the time of sending you this text, was, I believe, actively reading Lauren Berlant, who is, you know, famously the killer of the American dream. Um, and so mine was that if you work hard, there's nothing you can't do. <laughs> I just, I can't be an astronaut, it turns out. I mean... Listen, Hannah, not with that attitude is what I say. This is, stop it. <laughs> Listen, I could still get Best New Artist Grammy nominations, okay? It could still happen. It won't. It won't. Yeah, it won't because of all of your unsuccessful pre-existing albums. That's the problem. <laughs> You're not a new artist anymore. <laughs> it's true. Okay, we've got like a legit celebrity on our podcast today, so we're going to be super hasty. Please forgive us. We're just going to race our way right through revision. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are talking about fatness today. Finally, my favorite topic gets a whole episode. So what do we need to summarize here? I mean, like bodies, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we should start with bodies. Let's start with disability studies, since a lot of our discussion about non-normative bodies comes out of disability justice thinking. So way, way back in our first season, mm -hmm. we had guest academic extraordinaire Jess Battis on the show, and they introduced us to the medical versus social models of disability. So the medical model locates disability in the individual body, and it frames that disability as curable or treatable, while the social model distinguishes between impairment and the conditions that restrict people with impairments. So, for example, the medical model would identify someone as being disabled if they were not able to walk upstairs, while the social model would look at those stairs and be like, hey, stairs as the default instead of ramps, that's like a social and material condition that literally restricts the movement of some bodies. Yeah, exactly. And then we had Taya Garbeza on to talk to us a little bit more about disability studies, particularly via the metaphor of lycanthropy. Shout out to Shakira for always helping me remember how to say that word. Darling, it is no joke. This is lycanthropy. Which uses, quote unquote, monstrous bodies as shorthand for the fear of disabled bodies and culture's exclusion of those bodies based on fear of contagion. Taya also demonstrated to us how obsessed the wizarding world is with the idea of cure and curability 
and then introduced us to the work of Eli Clare, who in their book Brilliant Imperfection, Grappling with Cure, discusses society's obsession with quote-unquote curing disabled body minds in order to fit within the desired able-bodied norm and how harmful these ableist conceptions of cure are, especially for folks for whom a version of the self that isn't disabled doesn't exist. There's some like real eugenicist thinking undergirding that sort of fixation on cure. And of course, on the topic of monstrosity, we've got to talk about Jess Zimmerman, who came and joined us on the podcast to talk about how the figure of the monstrous woman has been used historically to codify those behaviors that are unacceptable for women, whether it's, you know, hunger, desire, ambition, anger, childlessness, intelligence, like literally anything, (laughs) any kind of being too much. And uh, Jess encouraged us not to reject monstrosity, but rather to embrace it and the kinds of possibilities that open up for us when we no longer fear being framed as monstrous. Mm. Oh, I love becoming monstrous. It's like becoming ungovernable, but with more claws. Tentacles. Yep, we're both right. And finally, of course, I can't personally, me, oh me, I can't think about techniques of policing women's bodies and behaviors without thinking about sentimentality. You? Yeah, me. (laughs) I know, a shock. Which, according to scholar Kyla Schuller, was one of many strategies used in the 19th century to codify sex difference in order to stabilize emergent white supremacist understandings of civility. Mm. You got to go back. Go back to the sentimentality episode if this is... But, you know, that's what (laughs) we're doing. This is revision. So, basically, Schuller's argument is that white women became responsible for managing the potential overflow of feeling that went hand-in-hand with the malleability of white people, which was a precondition for civilizability. So sentimentality became part of this whole sort of body of techniques for managing the fact that white women like had to be really feelingsy, but like maybe that could become too much. And the other techniques that emerged around the same time included temperance movements and diet. So the gendered policing of women's bodies was part of white supremacy's constitution of white women as responsible for civilization's, you know, emotional side, which is part of how some scholars have linked fat phobia to anti-blackness, because fatness becomes sort of a sign of like a failure to live up to this civilized white ideal. By the way, for more on that history, I really recommend Sabrina String's Fearing the Black Body, the Racial Origins of Fat Phobia, which is a great study. Hannah, we're not supposed to learn new things in revision. That's for the next Sorry. segment. Sorry. Ungovernable. Sorry. I'm too excited. Let's go. That was a whirlwind segment, but I just couldn't wait to start picking our guest's brain. Gross. In transfiguration class. Our guest today is writer and podcaster Aubrey Gordon. Pronouns she, her. She writes under the pseudonym Your Fat Friend, illuminating the experiences of fat people and urging justice for people of all sizes. She is co-host of the Maintenance Phase podcast, author of What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat, and most recently, the author of the brand new book, You Just Need to Lose Weight and 19 Other Myths About Fat People. Welcome, Aubrey. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to yell professionally about things that I yell about personally on the regs. This sounds great. Oh, my goodness. What what a delight to have you here. Why don't we just like launch in with a with a little some some light yelling (laughs) just to get a taste of it. Could you tell us a little bit about your relationship with the Harry Potter books? Yeah, I will say uh, like. It seemed like everyone under the sun when they came out. I was absolutely swept up in read every book as soon as it is released, all of that kind of stuff. I distinctly remember 
in my like freshman year in college, maybe was one of the uh, book release times. And I was back home from school and Powell's books in my hometown of Portland, Oregon had a big midnight release party where they were like projecting stars and moons and wizard stuff on the side of the building and had like a <laughs> band and it was like a whole thing. And I was there. I specifically wore a hat to just be like, I don't want to see any male classmates. This is. Oh, <laughs> I thought you meant like a sorting hat or something. No. Oh, God. No. Hat. Oh, my God. <laughs> I wish that I had approached that from a cosplay perspective and not from a, like, boo, you're at a release for a young adult book sort of perspective in the way that, like, a mortified teenager would. But that's what I did. And I was totally mortified about being recognized. And that is what happened like five other people from my high school graduating class were also there in line. And they were like, oh man, you're into these books? Me too! And it ended up being like a deeply lovely thing where I was like oh. totally mortified to be judged and didn't put together that if someone else was there to judge me, they were also there to get the book. Mm -hmm. Take it down a couple notches, anxiety. <laughs> Sort of later on in adulthood, my relationships to the books became a lot stickier as I went back and reread them as a fat adult who had sort of stopped trying to diet and lose weight. And a bunch of things that seemed really natural about the books to me the first time around seemed really unnatural and shoehorned in and alienating and like mean uh to me when i returned to them and then following that jk rowling was just like i have some thoughts about trans women internet and i was like oh great this isn't getting better neat <laughs> I just the way that she was like sorry did you read some subtext in my books that suggested that i might suck don't worry, I'm going to make a text for you. Confirmed. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. I got you. Yeah. So I would say the older I get, the stickier and more complex and more critical my view on the books becomes. Not because they aren't lovely and comforting and fun stories, but because every time someone with my body type is mentioned, it is like a real wild ride and usually a bad one. Uh-oh. I'm reading them to my daughter right now, and I've, I have talked about this in uh, in other places before, but like the the degree to which I am constantly editing the text on the page so that I'm not just like naturalizing hate speech, it's shocking. Also, the degree to which the plot has not changed when you just take out the adjective fat in front of everything. Everything that bad. Dudley yeah. does. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's almost as though it wasn't part wasn't of the plot not, at not all. Necessary. But we got another segment to talk about that. This is the segment where we get a like theoretical grounding. And our theoretical grounding today Aubrey is going to come from you and your great <laughs> mind and your cool book. Thanks, team. <laughs> That's great. I'll take that. Sure, ma'am. So you've structured your book around the idea of myths, right? You're talking about the myths about fat people. So when we're talking about the circulation of biases that contribute to marginalization and oppression, particularly related to fatness, where do these myths come from? How are they perpetuated? and turned into common sense. I mean, I think a couple of things. One, I would say that the source material for the myths is bias, which then the myths create some sort of justification for the bias and perpetuate it, right? So things like, quote-unquote, obesity is the leading cause of death in the United States or causes 400,000 deaths every year. That is a number that was retracted by the original authors of the study. And also, like, if 400,000 Americans were dropping dead every year just from being fat, you would know somebody? Yeah, you'd know somebody who died from fat. You would know someone who just got so fat they dropped dead, right? That's like not actually uh, empirically a thing. Fatness is associated with risk factors for other health conditions, which may prove fatal or complications from those things may prove fatal. But instead, we've decided to recenter all of those health risks just on the proxy indicator of the size of someone's body. So, I mean, I would say a lot of it is that, uh, the bias predates the science and therefore the bias is an underpinning of almost all of the science, right? 
the quite a bit of what we find when we look to sort of the construction of the quote unquote obesity epidemic is researchers who thought their research was not getting funded well enough and ran a campaign to get more funding and more media uh, attached to the scourge of quote unquote obesity. Right. And that led to pretty directly a huge spike in anti fat bias in the U.S. population. Right. And there is now research illustrating that exposure to that media the sort of um, constant media that we see in here that usually features B-roll footage of fat torsos in clothes that don't fit and usually with like a bag of McDonald's in the frame, right? That exposure to that kind of quote-unquote obesity epidemic media directly increases not only personal bias toward fat people, but individual dislike of other fat people. So there is sort of this idea uh, that this kind of bias and these sorts of um, myths actually like come from hard and fast science and you might not like the truth, but here's what it is and da 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 da. And when you start sort of peeling back the layers, what you see is that quite a bit of it is very heavily debated amongst scientists. It is far from a sort of foregone conclusion. And what that actually functionally allows us to do is what we set out to do in the first place, which is exclude fat people, judge fat people, and feel like we are good people for judging fat people sort of in the process, right? Feel like we're on a mission. I love this. And I, I immediately want to have like such a long conversation about like public health and science communication. But that's not what we do on this podcast. So we're not going to. Everybody, you know what? All our listeners already listened to Maintenance Face, so go keep listening to that. We really like talking about discourse and ideology, though. And imagine how my little heart lit up when I read you refer to these myths as, quote, tools of power and dominance. I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> Coach is going to edit this out. She hates when we snap while we talk. So when we are talking about discourse as a tool of dominance, it's often worth asking who is becoming more powerful via these discourses. So whose power and dominance is enhanced by structural fat phobia? Who's getting secretly rich? Yeah, totally. So I think there's two questions here. One is who's getting secretly rich, and two is who's getting cultural power. Ooh, ooh, economic and cultural capital. Ooh, Whoa, ooh. look at this go. <laughs> <laughs> I would say who's getting rich is pretty clearly people who are selling you solutions to the scourge of having a fat body, right? To the major problem of being larger than someone else expected you to be. So your Weight Watchers, although less so lately, their stock price is down about two thirds in the last year. Ooh. Oh, and didn't Jenny Craig just go bust? Jenny Craig just went bust. Ooh, just dance on that grave. At the same time, Novo Nordisk is just like printing money as they make Ozempic oh, uh, yeah. and Wegovi and Manjaro and all of those, right? So like drug companies are doing quite well out of this and have been active players in the construction of the obesity epidemic um, because if it's a public health issue, then surprise, your product is now a necessity to an entire nation state. So that's part one is just like who's getting rich. Part two is who's getting cultural power. And I think this is a place where it's really useful to think about meritocracy as a construct and who is served by meritocracy as a construct. And it's always the people who are already on top of the quote unquote meritocracy, right? Yeah. Pretend you earned it and everybody else who's not the same as you didn't. Totally. That's exactly right. So like for... People my size, for example, according to the National Institutes of Health, I have a less than one tenth of one percent chance of attaining my sort of BMI recommended healthy weight in my lifetime, right? That I am likely to be fat for the whole rest of my life. And what that means and what we've sort of told ourselves about fatness is you're just not working hard enough. You haven't tried enough things. You haven't worked hard enough at it. And if you did, things would be really different for you. And I would actually be able to tell by looking at you. And I can now tell by looking at you that you're not really trying. You haven't really dieted. You might be saying that you did, but you didn't. And your body is sort of an abject failure. And 
I think we focus a lot on the ways in which that marginalizes fat people and excludes fat people and sets a whole cultural template for thinking about fat people. And something that we talk about less is how much individual thin people benefit from having their body type complemented, from people assuming that they have a trick to stay thin when like the rest of us, then people are mostly dealing with a genetic hand that they were dealt, right? And an environmental hand and all of that sort of stuff. So, I mean, I think there is both this question of like, who's getting rich? And that is absolutely like snidely whiplash territory, like full villain stuff. But when we look at sort of our social scripts for complementing weight loss, for staying silent about weight gain, little moments like that that happen every day, what we're doing is constantly telling thin people that they are better than fat people. Um, and I think that's an uncomfortable reward to look at, but it is one that is kind of everywhere all the time. As an add-on to that, can I just ask a little bit more about like what kind of thinking underpins that belief? that like fat people could become thin people if we wanted to enough because i think that sort of myth of total potential bodily control is really pervasive yeah i mean i think again the source code for that one is the pre-existing bias right um that but where does that come from well, I think part of the place where that comes from is kid lit and YA lit, honestly. Oh, no. Like, if we're talking, I'm genuinely sorry. Whoops. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, like, particularly in my niece and nephew growing up, trying to find books for them that, first of all, included fat characters, and second of all, included fat characters that were not a punchline or a bully was extraordinarily difficult. I think this is one of those things like a gender binary, like looksism, like all kinds of stuff that we just uh, are sort of thrust into a world and it is thrust upon us. Um, and we aren't really given another option of a way to think about fatness and fat people. So I think that's kind of the the beginnings of all of that starts really, really, really young. And honestly, like, even for parents with uh, small children or even infants will be told the BMI of their infant. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics is now recommending weight loss interventions for kids as young as two, right? Like, these are messages that start extraordinarily young. Um, so the idea that we could somehow escape it or be without bias in that environment doesn't really hold water for me yeah you just raise kids in uh in caves it's fine yeah totally just as an like experiment cheese. like gruyere cave age, age children in <laughs> caves like cheese i, Quote I say it every day <laughs> <laughs> so aubrey in the killjoy spirit of ruining people's fun and given uh your exquisite capacity to bust myths is there a particular myth that you take pleasure in busting, one that you would like to highlight for us? Boy, oh boy, oh boy. There are so many to pick from. <laughs> I would say the one that tends to be a really good entry point for folks and thankfully is becoming more known now is the origins of the BMI, which mm. is our sort of primary way for measuring uh, who we consider to be medically fat or medically thin, right? Mm -hmm. For the uninitiated, for the unfamiliar, uh, the BMI was created by a Belgian astronomer, not a doctor. <laughs> uh, he was real mad that the Enlightenment was leaving Belgium in the dust, and he genuinely wanted to put Belgium on the map. Uh, <laughs> that was his main yeah, thing. Yeah, another thing the Enlightenment fucked up for all of us. Yeah. I mean, no question, right? <laughs> He was trying to find the average man, which he considered to be an ideal. So if he could find an average of people's physicality and behaviors and all kinds of things, then that would be something we could all strive toward. Just mediocrity. Just collectively strive for being totally average. Absolutely. Listen, if we're all striving for mediocrity, he nailed it uh, <laughs> because his uh, source material for this was exclusively white men who were military conscripts in the 1800s. So if you are not a French soldier, the BMI was not built for you. 
It then sort of sat on a shelf for a while until it got picked up by American insurance companies who wanted to find ways to charge some policyholders more and some policyholders less. Uh, And they decided on fat folks to charge more. From there, it kind of backed its way into the medical system, most notably with a study that found that it was the least ineffective tool for quote-unquote predicting obesity. It won out over water displacement and calipers, and it was found to, and I quote, correctly predict obesity about 50% of the time. (laughs) The BMI was Never designed for, nor was it ever adjusted for, anyone who's not a cis man and anybody who's not white. Uh, And it has been shown repeatedly to harm the health of trans people, communities of color, uh, women, all kinds of folks. That one tends to be like a real welcome to the party kind of (laughs) myth to bust, right? Yeah. Yeah. Has your appetite been whetted? Here we go. (laughs) There's more where that came from. (laughs) I have sort of one last like really burning question I want to ask, which is about fat liberation versus body positivity. And if you could talk a little bit about like the theoretical and political differences between those movements. I should start out by saying that the body positivity movement has sort of two twin roots. One is radical fat activism that dates back to, uh, according to some, the 60s, according to some prior to that. Uh, And the other is eating disorder recovery spaces. Initially, it was conceived as a justice movement for folks whose bodies put them on the margins. In the 2000s, a bunch of corporations got wind that that was a phrase that people were using and started using it in their commercials for a halo top or soap or what have you. And the movement was flooded with a bunch of people who had seen TV ads but didn't necessarily assent to like an anti-racist politic or a disability justice framework or any of that kind of stuff. So it very quickly sort of collapsed in on itself and became... Uh, a series of maxims, right? That were things like, uh, love your body and who cares what anybody else thinks and body positivity is for you as long as you're happy and healthy. And over time that became, I'm in favor of body positivity as long as you're not quote unquote obese, right? So the very people who had sort of created the movement or co-created the movement were being shut out of it. And over time, many, many fat folks have, uh, you know, ceased to call themselves body positive, myself among them. Fat liberation is sort of an interesting one. It dates back to uh, the fat underground in the 1970s, um, which was a radical queer collective of Jewish folks who I think mostly identified as lesbians. Good. Um, fat Jewish fat lesbians. Folks. Yes. God, yes. love them. Yes. <laughs> yes. Love it. Love it. <laughs> they essentially like wrote a list of demands uh, of things that they wanted to see, things ranging from a movement that is forged in uh, allegiance to all oppressed people. Mm -hmm. to accountability for and an end to the diet industry, Mm -hmm. to uh, accurate medical information for fat folks and competent care for fat folks. I mean, really baseline things that I think even today read as pretty radical for folks who are not deeply steeped in fat politics and categorically should not be seen as radical things, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Like the idea that fat people should be able to get competent health (laughs) care does not strike me as like a radical demand. (laughs) And yet. And yet. And yet here we are, right? I think fat liberation is having like a renaissance right now and is being sort of collectively defined and redefined in community like right now as we speak. So it's a framework that is I think, generally aligned with more social justice principles. It's more explicitly anti-oppression, more explicitly political, um, and very clear that fat folks are at its center, right? Leaving much less room for thin people who saw a Halo Top ad to show up and be like, this movement is mine now, (laughs) right? Which is sort of like, through no one's ill intent, the way that that particular cookie crumbled. Oh my God, you're so kind and generous <laughs> <laughs> to say through no one's ill intent ill intent through advertisers and 
unchecked implicit bias Mm. from many of those thin folks, right? But I don't think anyone set out to be like, I'm hatching a plan to hurt fat people, (laughs) right? That's just the way that people operate, right? Like, I think it's actually much more damning that people's default setting is like, I don't need to think about fat people's humanity and I don't consider it ill intent. Yeah. There's such an ongoing fundamental failure to think about fat people's humanity that I can see how body positivity worms its way through by constantly offering thin people a way for it to be about them. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think even in fat liberation spaces, even in sort of fat justice work, it is absolutely remarkable to me the consistency with which thin folks can refocus themselves and will identify themselves not as a potential sort of source of bias <laughs> or a person with bias to work through, but will consistently identify themselves with fat people and recenter themselves as the most injured parties under a system of diet culture, which is real wild when fat people are dying of anti-fatness, right? Like that is a that is a wild take team. Um and it is sort of the main take uh from from many straight sized folks on uh on fat politics. It's like that or You've got blood on your hands. This is very dangerous. How dare you? (laughs) Which is, again, wild to say about a movement advocating for health care. I'm just thinking it might be useful to uh, talk through a couple of terms, maybe, Um, because one of the things that I really had no idea was the origins of the term obesity and why, why the term obese is incredibly shitty. And so... Would you be able to maybe just give us a quick primer on, like, why obesity? Not a great term. Yeah. So there is this idea that, you know, doctors can't hurt your feelings. Right. <laughs> it's sort of the idea. And I think there's two things to know there. One is this is a term that predates its medical use. Uh, it dates back to Latin, where it literally translates to having eaten oneself fat, right? So there is inherent judgment in you did this to yourself is built right into the term, which is in defiance of, again, like everything we know scientifically at this point. <laughs> Uh, counteracts that. And the other thing that I would say is I would urge folks to reconsider the sort of framing of it's a medical term. You don't get to be hurt by it because I would say fat folks experience astronomical rates of misdiagnosis, mistreatment in doctor's offices, not having equipment that works for us. I mean, my own personal history with uh, healthcare providers is that Almost any time I go in for almost anything, I'm told that I need to first lose weight and then come back when I have lost weight and they will look at my symptoms. And what that means is that whatever condition you had progresses and gets worse and becomes more threatening, right? So I would say rather than thinking this term can't be harmful because doctors use it, I would urge folks to reconsider that and think about it as specifically because it's used in medical contexts. It is extra hurtful. One of the places where folks experience the most overt um, and life-threatening anti-fatness is at the hands of healthcare providers who are trained to do incredible work in many, many ways, but are never actually trained to confront their own biases against almost any community and certainly not fat folks. Okay, I mean, you know, I wish we could talk about Bruno Latour, but everybody will just have to go and read your book um, because I think we really need to get into (laughs) those those YA novels that underpin structural bias. Let's do it. Holy. (laughs) Yes. You see that? That's a professional. Well, now that we've busted some myths about anti-fatness, let's test our knowledge by looking at how the myths about fat people show up in popular culture. And one piece of popular culture in particular, known as Harry Potter. It's time for owls. All right, Aubrey, the time has come for us to yell about Dudley. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Well, I'm curious about before, once I launch, there's not a lot of coming back for me. (laughs) So I'm curious about for you all, what are your sort of thoughts on Dudley as a fat character in particular? What, like, what do you feel like you're bringing to this conversation about Dudley? 
in the original run of this podcast, when we when we did it in 2015, the two things that we got the most pushback on was our claim that the representations of the Dursleys were fat phobic and our claim that the goblins were anti-Semitic caricatures. <laughs> Boy, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, those okay. were the- Anthony Goldstein is in the books. Yeah, people were like, the goblins are not the Jews of the wizarding world because there's one Jew. We found him. His name is Anthony Goldstein. You know he's Jewish because his last name is Goldstein. But people were really, really <laughs> upset with our like basic claim that the emphasis on the fatness of the Dursleys might be just a use of the sort of harmful shorthand wherein fatness is meant to stand in for all kinds of moral failings Mm, mm -hmm. because people really wanted to be like well no but they're starving harry and like they're eating like dudley's eating all the food Mm -hmm. and harry doesn't get any food so it's like they're and i mean like they were like he's an abused child which like yeah true absolutely Both of these things can be the case. Like so many things in these books, it's a kind of quick and thoughtless shorthand that's meant to tell us everything we need to know about characters who we will not get any further sort of interiority from. We've got a lot of these kinds of shorthands. So it's like, well, how do we know that Dudley is a spoiled bully Mm -hmm. and that his parents are bad parents who are negligent towards children, Mm -hmm. we make Dudley fat and we make his mom be into him being fat. Because can you imagine a more monstrous mother figure than that? One of the things that I'm really interested in is the way that in book five, all of a sudden the narrative around Dudley's fatness shifts because we're told that there's been an intervention from the school. Uh, I was thinking about this when I was listening to your book, Aubrey, because of the chapter where you talk about how chapters, but in particular where you focus on schools intervening and... And like kids being taken away from their families, like the... BMI report cards, the whole shebang. Exactly, yeah. And so up to book five, we just get the sense that like, okay, well, there's a sort of objective omniscient narrator that's calling Dudley fat. But then once we get to book five, all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, no, now Aunt Petunia can't ignore it anymore. And so these other objective third parties have intervened. And so something must be done. Is it that late? Is it book five? I thought he was on a diet earlier than that. He's on a diet in book four. Because then in book five, he's boxing, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. Okay. Book four is when he gets put on his like grapefruit and cottage cheese diet. Yes, and the that's whole family right. Has and to Harry is literally starving. Yes. But Dudley <laughs> also literally starving. And it's seen as like a stand in for his bad behavior once again, because uh, he gets so upset that he throws his PlayStation out the window. Uh, is part of the diet story. I will say that one, returning to that one, whew, as a kid who was put on a lot of diets, uh, it is extremely wild the way that that is played as a caricature and also seems to be played for laughs. Mm-hmm. Like, everybody laugh at the bully right now. Yeah. Look at, oh, he can't even skip a meal. Look at that. Right? But, like, it is seen as part of his comeuppance. He has to get thin and he can't even do that. At one point, uh, we talked about this a little bit ahead of the record, but like, my God, man, the first time you meet his group of friends, they are described as all being big and stupid. And Dudley is the leader because he's the biggest and stupidest of them all. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. When he gets pranked at one point by I think it's the Weasleys, they give him a pigtail. That that is something that Hagrid does to him yeah. when oh, Jesus Dudley hell. starts eating Harry's birthday cake that mm-hmm. Hagrid brought because he obviously can't help but just like immediately begin to compulsively eat any cake put near him. And Hagrid tries to turn him into a pig and and fails to do so and just gives him a pigtail. Which has to be surgically removed, I believe. Yes. And that is absolutely played as a laugh and is one of many ways in which fat people are ritualistically punished in this series, primarily through, I was thinking about this, and the so we've got Dudley being turned into a pig, we've got Aunt Marge 
being blown up into a giant balloon. And then we've got the scene where Slughorn uh, disguises himself as a huge overstuffed armchair. Mm -hmm. (gasps) I had completely forgotten about that Mm -hmm. one. Yep. I was like, oh, this is really interesting. This like recurring trope of, of taking fat bodies and literally transforming them into non-human objects or or sort of more literal monstrosities as a way of just being like look how gross these people are like it's it's in keeping with the tradition of magical punishment as it operates in this series and clearly fatness is punishable according to the logic of the series and i would say listen this is not a trope that jk rowling invented by any no. stretch of the imagination right i think to your point earlier hannah it feels really like it's sort of this thoughtless picking up of tropes that's just like oh if there's a bully it's a fat kid mm-hmm. right yeah like if there's bad parenting happening like what's the you know apex of bad parenting letting your kid get fat mm-hmm. huh? Not like that kid's life falling apart or being a bad person to be around <laughs> or any of that sort of stuff. It has to be, it has to have this sort of layer of uh, icing on the cake that is like, and it has to be a fat person, mm-hmm. right? It's a tough one. Dudley is a tough one because you are meant to hate him <laughs> in the book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And his there's no question that his conduct is terrible. And I think there is a way of reading this character as a kid who is uh, pushing back against forced changes to his body, mm-hmm. which no matter what you sort of think about him and his actions, that is a uh, a wild position to be put in as a child um, to have to defend the way that you look, to have to defend your size. And when I have gone back to that as an adult and read it, I feel small and powerless in the way that I felt as a kid being put on diets, Mm -hmm. small and powerless, right? Because this is, again, not Rowling's own invention, but an encapsulation about how most of us have been taught to think about fat kids, Mm -hmm. right? And it just feels really restrictive and kind of awful that there aren't a lot of like fat people who are good people with their own stories and their own complexities happening in this book. Now that I'm thinking about that kind of pushback that we got in talking about the way that Harry represents the Dursleys and his anti-fat language and, and, and stuff, like I'm wondering if part of the problem that people were having is that that kind of critique meant that Harry was himself hateful in this like hateful dynamic. So the Dursleys treat him bad, so he should be allowed to hate them. But then to be told that, like, well, the way that he's hating them is actually really oppressive and hurtful to readers. I think that made a lot of folks uncomfortable. Yeah, I will say it feels reminiscent as you're sort of describing that dynamic. I'm like, oh, that's familiar. That is uh, very reminiscent to me of fat folks' critiques, not of Donald Trump, but of the discourse around Donald Trump. Yes. Which made fun as much or more of him for being a fat person than for being a racist and like a serial sexual abuser and assaulter and like having terrible policies and stoking white nationalism and all of these things that he did instead of focusing on those points, we ended up focusing on things like Mara Lardass or whatever, right? Uh, and that whole, like, the picture of his butt looking big and things like that, right? I still remember a, a tweet from the time where somebody was like, this is going to have zero impact on him, but it is going to make the lives of fat people who are not rich and powerful worse. Totally. Right. He's not going to see your tweet, but Every fat person who follows you is and is going to learn that you're not actually a safe person to be around and talk to about this stuff and that it is more important to you to dunk on somebody for being fat than it is to sort of fix the political problem that we're in. I think, listen, Dudley Dursley is fictional and a child and not Trump. Yeah. (laughs) We'll start there. Three, you know what? Three undeniable facts. So true. I'm here to deliver on facts. (laughs) That is a child and not a president. I know the difference. (laughs) But I think there's similarly, like, listen, part of what anti-fatness does is distract us from the actual actions and character of fat people, including bad fat people. Right. right? That it becomes 
becomes the main target instead of talking about like Dudley is straightforwardly a bully. Yeah. yeah. And wouldn't it be interesting if this book spent some time on how did he get to be that way? What would accountability for his bullying look like rather than accountability, quote unquote, for his fatness? Right. Like, I I think there's a pretty rich conversation that gets missed when we just sort of revert to talking about folks' bodies. And I will also say for Dudley and Vernon both, like, every description of them is like, their fat chins obscured their non-existent necks on top of their round torsos before they heaved themselves out of their chairs and waddled fattily down the hall, right? Where you're just like, truly like, he used his fat finger to touch the phone fatly. Like, what? Why? (laughs) Sarah Hollowell, who is a fantastic uh, young adult writer herself and a fat person, wrote a tweet at one point that was like, I need thin writers to understand that the way that they write fat people is very reminiscent of the way that, like, cis men write about women, Mm. (laughs) which is just like, her breasts were heaving when she woke up. And you're like, okay, (laughs) you're focusing on the weirdest things. You're focusing on the weirdest things. All right. Okay. We've talked about Dudley and the stereotype of the fat bully. And we've talked a little bit about the like stereotype of the bad parents having a fat child. Let's talk a little bit more about some of our other fat adults. Mm. Because we've got Hagrid, Mm -hmm. we've got Molly Weasley, Mm -hmm. and we've got Horace Slughorn, who are sort of the big, for me, the big three, Mm -hmm. the big three other fat characters in this book. And upon reading a little bit more about how Hagrid is described in the series, I was really struck by him at one point being described as simply too big to be allowed, which is a, an incredible thing to say, um, and my new tattoo. But he is this other fat stereotype, right? Like, he's cheerful, he's bumbling, he's stupid, he bumps into things all the time. He doesn't know his own strength. He's kind of like the big fat clown. Yeah, and I think he also, uh, there's quite a bit of like Santa DNA (laughs) in the Hagrid character mm -hmm. construction. Just sort of the jolliness and friendliness and providing for folks and all of that is in there. Mm. And I think the other thing that really has stood out to me on this most recent reread is how many characteristics Hagrid shares with the uh, fat best friends in Mm -hmm. rom-coms, right? That, like, he is there to sort of help along the plot lines of and assist the more real and more sort of valorous thin characters, mm-hmm. right? That they are the center of the action. He has considerably fewer plot lines of his own, right? And like, listen, every story has a main character, but this particular trope of like a fat person who only exists in service to thin people is like an extremely pervasive one. And one that I would say just anecdotally, like greatly influences the expectations of uh, from thin people sort of aimed at fat people. Right. There is this expectation that we will be present to be sort of emotional midwives to whatever comes next in a thin person's life, that we will uh, absent our own needs and do whatever they need first. Right. And I think that there will not uh, be a point at which we need their assistance, uh, but there will be a point at which sort of eternally we are available to them Mm -hmm. to assist them in whatever ways that they need and see fit. Mm -hmm. That feels like it has really sort of shown through with Hagrid's character. And again, there are many dynamics going on there. He is a staff at a school. They are kids, right? Mm -hmm. Like there are formal sort of like care responsibilities at play here. But I think there's a way of doing that in a way that gives Hagrid more of a plot line more of a personality and less of that kind of clownish characterization that you were talking about. What do you all think about Hagrid as a fat character? Clown, for sure. Check. Clown, for sure. Um, Desexualized or his, or his potential sexuality is rendered exclusively something that can be played for comedy, which is a really common way that fat people and fat people's sexuality is played in popular culture, for sure, right? Like, he is allowed to date somebody, but it's got to be, like, kind of funny and gross. 
I mean, listen, this is Fat Monica on Friends, right? She, like, is allowed to date exactly one person, and it's the other fat dude who can't stop eating and can't stop talking about Star Wars, right? And that is seen as her sort of, like, quote-unquote punishment for being a fat person, is you don't get to get someone who other people might consider attractive or worthy. This is a character that's coded in such a way as to be considered undesirable. It's worth remembering, too, that even when he does have a romantic interest, not only is that sort of played for the embarrassment of our main three, but also it doesn't it doesn't get to work out. And like, I know I've written some fan fiction in my head about how like it's really special and beautiful that they like get to be friends and support each other. But like, it is also just reiterating that Hagrid is not allowed to be like a romantic, a romantic character or a sexual character that he and Madame Maxime like become colleagues in the war on Voldemort and not Like, we never hear about them, like, dating or kissing or anything that, like... There isn't even a single scene where they bone. God. Not even a Uh, single little kiss. I do love Madame Maxime as, like, an iconic giant woman. Mm -hmm. Um, But she does not have the same kind of comfort with her giantness as Hagrid does. Mm -hmm. Like, literally, right? That, like, he's, like, he, he tells everybody that he's half giant. And he's like, you must also be half giant. And she's like, how dare you? Uh, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> how dare you, Hagrid? <laughs> this one feels like it's about the limits of the author's imagination insofar as those are the limits of our cultural mm-hmm. imagination around fatness and fat people, which is sort of like if you try to imagine a happy fat person in a good functional relationship, like I think many people's brains just go like footage not found. Roseanne question mark. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Like there's just like so few examples mm-hmm. of that, that like, you know, overwhelmingly any sort of fat, romantic plot lines um, end with some level of self-sabotage from a fat person or from the natural conclusion that that fat person can't be desired or loved or whatever, because it feels like we can't actually let our brains get to the point of fat people being loved and experiencing pleasure and all of these sorts of things, right? I also find the gender dynamic really interesting because for all that, we have discussed how Hagrid like does not perform traditional masculinity in many ways. And our, you know, our uh, our sibling podcast, The Gaily Prophet, reads Hagrid very strictly as a beautiful trans woman. And also, I think that kind of model of fatness, which is a kind of expansive and jovial fatness that includes taking up a lot of space does tend to be a fat stereotype that is more acceptable for men because it does have this like, yeah, sure, like he's taking up a lot of space, but like he's taking it up usefully. Like he does strong guy things. He's strong fat. Again, like available for service. Available for service. Yeah. Yeah. Hand in hand with that, I think, is the way that as our sort of big three protagonists get older, Rather than seeing Hagrid as an increasingly complex figure with an increasingly rich inner life, they just become progressively more embarrassed of him and spend less and less time with him. When they all drop his class. Every time I think about it, it makes me so sad. The book where Hagrid's like, you guys never come see me anymore. I'm like, ah, no. I mean, listen. Hagrid and Molly Weasley both, I think, are like two of the most absolutely lovable Mm -hmm. uh, fat characters in this whole shebang. I have deep fondness for both of them. And I feel like my critiques of both of those characters are just that they aren't allowed to like be set free, Mm. fly free, go have a Mm -hmm. plot line, go have some adventures. Right. But that we sort of get these like. Uh, very limited glimpses into their lives. And those limited glimpses are, you know, territory that is pretty well trod in depictions of fat characters. Yeah. On the on the topic of Molly Weasley, I was, as I was thinking about her, I found myself returning to what was for me a very formative early text of uh, fat cultural criticism, which is Stacey Bias's Good Fatties Archetypes. Which one do you think Molly Weasley is? 
I think she's the maternal hen archetype. Correct. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a set of archetypes of the way that fat people are both are represented in culture, but also often are sort of framed in interpersonal relationships or even understand ourselves, which includes it's the good fatty archetype. So it's like how you can be fat and sort of perceived as a as a good person at the same time. And they usually have to do with sort of providing some kind of service <laughs> of some variety or with like proving that you're allowed to be fat. Like one of them is the fat unicorn who's like, yeah, I'm fat, but but everything about my health is good. I'm completely healthy. I'm perfectly healthy. And then there's the fat athlete. There's the the dead fatties, one of them. The last one, which is the one that uh, the first time I was ever reading it, I was like, oh, burn, Stacey. Because the last one is like the radical fatty who's like, fuck you, I'm eating a donut. And I was like, God damn it. <laughs> oh my God. That was 100% me at the time that I read that as well. Was I considering a live fat, die yum tattoo at that point? I certainly was. Yeah. Ugh. So Molly Weasley then like embodies the maternal hen archetype because she takes the role of feeding all the children very seriously, right? Like she she makes like I think like six bacon sandwiches per child. And this, I think, was the same. I think this is book four. I think this is this was in contrast to Dudley's cottage cheese and quarter of a grapefruit uh, diet. And so it was just like, oh, so some kinds of some kinds of moms are allowed to give their children lots of food, like half a dozen bacon sandwiches per child, whereas other moms are not. It's wild because six bacon sandwiches is absolutely the like anti fat imagination of what fat people are eating constantly. Just like an endless yeah. pile of bacon and bread, I guess. Do you eat a whole cake? I mean, listen, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's what I had for breakfast. <laughs> so I get it. I think it's really interesting. And I'm sure this is a point I've made before, but <laughs> who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, that Molly feeds her children as enthusiastically as uh, Petunia does. And Molly is a good parent because her children remain thin. Despite the fact that, like, the amount of food that Dudley has access to is framed as part of his being misparented, it makes it clear when you contrast the Dursley household with the Weasleys, it makes it clear that the issue is not the food itself, which does, again, reinforce this idea that, like, if you're a good person, then you can eat as much as you want and remain thin. If you become fat by virtue of eating, it's probably because of your bad fat attitude. There is something there about, like, you're only allowed to eat if people think you don't mm -hmm. eat, <laughs> right? Uh, or if you have earned you're it. You're only allowed to have food if you yeah, don't enjoy absolutely. it. absolutely. Absolutely. Or if you have, like, quote unquote, earned it through being thin enough. Like, that is an absolutely bananas approach to food to look at someone and be like, have your little, like, Robocop dossier of like, Brr, you can eat or Brr, no, you can't. <laughs> right. Like, it's 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 really wild. And it, I think that's an outstanding insight into this book. I think that's exactly right. Petunia's uh, terrible. Uh, and uh, Molly is great. And that is a result not of their own bodies, but of the bodies of their children. Yeah. <laughs> which is also misogynist, what? which is fun. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Shocker. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about a threshold character who is Personally, one of my favorites, but I think not an objectively maternal hen type like Molly and Hagrid, but maybe more complex. And it's Slughorn. I want to talk about Slughorn. Yeah. Where do you want to start with Slughorn? I want to start with the dinners. I want to start with the fact that he invites students to private dinners with him. I'm with you, Marcel. He is he is my like favorite vision of fatness in the books because I'm like I too would like to dress in velvet mm -hmm. and preside over for a luxurious meal, and also he's like 
easily bribed and manipulated by his students by virtue of giving being given candy. Candied pineapple specifically. Candied pineapple, which, you know what? It does slap, so I get yeah. it. But also, right, he's like a collector. He hoards things. He's selfish. Like, he's got this kind of version of gluttony that is not always only food but is like a whole lifestyle even when he's like on the run from the death eaters there's something about the fact that he makes his home in muggle houses so like the muggles aren't there and he just sort of he just sort of goes in and uses their stuff yeah yeah squatters Mm, rights for squatters rights yeah (laughs) yeah There is this sort of trope at play with Slughorn and with Dudley both, which is the ceiling for what fat people can achieve is how much we're willing to not eat, right? That like being bribed by candied pineapple, first of all, please, everyone bribe me with candied pineapple. (laughs) That sounds great. That sounds great. But like there's this idea that fat people can be uh, outwitted at any turn if you just have a tasty little morsel to offer them, right? It's like uh, distracting a dog with a raw steak, like that kind of old cartoony thing, right? It's literally how Tom Riddle gets him to explain how horcruxes work. Pineapple, is that, he gives him a treat. <laughs> like a dog. Boy, oh boy. Yeah, I mean, like, there are a lot of ways in which this series feels like anti-fat tropes' greatest Mm. hits. Like, now that's what I call anti-fatness. We've got the fat friend. We've got the mom. We've got the mean fat bully, right? Like, And this is another one, which is, like, the guy who will do anything for a good Mm -hmm. meal, right? Like, (laughs) Including, Mm -hmm. like, you know, give an absolute villain the keys to the kingdom sort of moves right like it's a it's a real situation okay i've got i've got one last question for us this is my kind of like galaxy brain meta question which is what can we say about cultural circulations of fat phobia like this beyond that they suck <laughs> and like are bad and perpetuate stereotypes because my sense that like we're, you know, oh, we're we're making some progress. People are paying a little bit more attention. Really got sort of the, the wind knocked out of it when the whale won uh, Oscar in 2023 for putting Brendan Fraser in a fucking fat suit. I was like, you know, what's the function of this kind of critique? When we point it out, does it do anything? I mean, listen, this is the thesis statement of my career. (laughs) We'll find out. I don't know. (laughs) TBD. Uh, I mean, I think my hope is if we're thinking about how social, cultural, and political change happens. Um, There's this model in organizing called the crest of the wave. uh, And the idea is that a policy change, like a public policy change, is the very last thing that happens uh, in sort of change work, right? That the first things that happen are social and cultural, and those build the momentum to allow us to crest into some kind of... uh, policy change. Um, And I think of this work as being part of that momentum building so that, like, listen, as we have mentioned, uh, there is this sort of idea that uh, body size is a hierarchy and a meritocracy, right? And my hope, certainly, and again, question mark on effectiveness, um, (laughs) is that uh, folks will uh, use this as like a little bit of a media literacy guide, right? And we'll start to see anti-fatness more like fat folks see it more readily when it pops up, that folks will start to have a little bit of, you know, like no need to leave your favorite properties, no need to stop watching your favorite movies or reading your favorite books. But clocking how those things treat their fat characters feels like a really important part of building folks' lens so that when we get to the point of advocating for more concrete social change, folks have more of a sense of just how pervasive this stuff is, just how insidious it is, right? All of that kind of stuff. And 
how it is not necessarily, again, the work of like ill intent all the time. In some cases, as with my own reading of Harry Potter, it is just sort of like, these are the tropes that we deal with in young adult literature. These are the kinds of characters we're used to seeing. So we reproduce them. It's kind of boilerplate in some ways, right? That there would be like a jolly fat guy, <laughs> and, uh, you know, like a mom who's got all the food <laughs> and like a mean bully, right? That like all of that that stuff, once you see it here, my hope is that folks will then go back to whatever else you like to watch and are sort of taking note of how those things treat fat folks. I don't, what do you all th- like? What do you think is the end game of all no, this? No, that stuff? was perfect. We're just going to end <laughs> the segment there. We're just going to end it right there with that absolutely perfect summary of like the ideal of what we hope critical reading might accomplish. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Crushed it. Thank you, witches, for joining us for another episode of Witch Please. If you have questions, comments, concerns, or praise, praise us. Come hang out with us at A Witch Please on Instagram or Twitter. We're also on Patreon at patreon.com slash a witch please, where you can get all kinds of ooh, exclusives. Maybe I just say that all the time now. Stop it. Where you can get all kinds of exclusive perks, including a sneak peek already available right this very second of our new podcast. If you want to know what it's going to be, go to Patreon and you will find out. Is that, did that get you excited? Listen, <laughs> I'm excited. I don't, Good. I, I feel like I'm a listener surrogate now and I'm like, okay, Good. I'll go to Patreon. That sounds great. Aubrey, if people want more of your work, where can they find it? You can listen to Maintenance Phase, where we sort of debunk and decode a bunch of uh, weight loss and wellness trends wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can get both of my books uh, wherever you buy books, wherever you listen to audiobooks, wherever you find ebooks, uh, all of those things. Uh, and I'm at YR Fat Friend sort of across platforms. So that's me. Well, you're not going to believe this, but Which Please is shockingly a Witch Please production and distributed by Acast. <laughs> you can find the rest of our episodes and soon the rest of our podcasts, plural, on Acast or at ohwitchplease.ca. Here are some other things you can do at ohwitchplease.ca. You can sign up for our amazing monthly newsletter, The Monthly Hoot. You can access our transcripts. You can give us your money. I mean, by merch, you can you can buy our merch. You can find reading lists for our episodes. There's just so much. Yeah, yeah, it's hot. Special thanks to everyone on the Witch Please team, including our digital projects coordinator, Gabby Iori, our social media manager and marketing designer, Zoe Mix, our sound engineer, Eric Magnus, and last but the opposite of least, the most, our executive producer, Hannah Rehack, a.k.a. Coach. At the end of every episode, we shout out everyone who left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. So you've got to review us if you want to hear me hop off the plane at LAX with, with a, a dream, dream in my car and again. My card again. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks this week to HS Gurley, Sam EM53, Amelia the Mountain Goat. How do you stay up there? El Sav W. Sada7686, Conrad Dad, or possibly Conrad Ad, unclear, Valeriuska, Cake on the Roof, Postmodern Peach, Katie A2K14, and David's Bowie. We'll be back next episode to append another appendix. But until then, later, witches.